test things. Um, Kevin Salvage is here from Leader and will um, take us through some of the uh, basic uh, principles on how to do ST2110 testing in an actual media environment. So take it away. Morning. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming on a Sunday morning. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the kind of test and measurement side of 2110. So my name's Kevin Salvage. I'm from Leader Europe, uh, based in London. And um, as we're broadcast engineers, let's start from the point we know and then move into the new world. So these types of displays we've been using within the broadcast industry for many years. They're all familiar to you. Some of them are slightly newer as we've moved with newer color spaces. But generally, the principles have stayed the same. So these are traditionally displays that are being used by engineers and production staff to test SD signals. But they're not actually testing the integrity of the SDI signal, they're testing the color system. So we've had another suite of tools with the implementation of SDI. So status displays that gives you information on the signal and a number of error codes within that SDI signal. Physical layer measurements with eye pattern, with jitter, and then obviously the critical parts of timing against black and burst reference. So these tools have been an integral part of measuring the SDI signal. But are they relevant when it comes to measuring ST2110 sources? The first thing is obviously to compare the two. And as you can see, with SDI, we have a physical layer, we have coding, we have baseband. In the IP world, we have the seven layer OSI model. Oh, we. Yeah. What? No, 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 oh, sorry. Yeah. Do it that way. Yep. Oh, sorry. Technology, it'll yeah, kill me. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, we have the essence with BNC connectors, one times 1080, 50, or 60p. It's unidirectional, it goes one way. If you want to come back, it's another cable, and back it comes. In the IP world, with 100 gig, we're looking at seven, up to 75 signals. Bidirectional. Measurement with SDI is direct. You're measuring the signal at the back of the test and measurement unit. As we move into the IP world, we're going to do indirect measurement because with the software defined networks, you're going to be able to pick up and point on the system where you want to measure. It could be the output of a switch, it could be directly on the output of the camera. You're going to be able to move where you measure the signal. Probably the biggest challenge we face is the fact that SDI was synchronous. It was regular, bump, bump, bump. Our IP systems are asynchronous. They will push as much data through the switches as the switches will allow. Then you have a whole suite with SDI of reasons for failures like cable loss, mismatch impedance, jitter, signal rise and fall time. With IP, we get a completely different set of packet loss this could be due to network traffic, which might not be anything to do with the signals we're putting through there. They might be other systems. And obviously, there is a set of measurement tools in that below. So this kind of gives you an idea of where we are and where we're going. So I've dropped the following in to try and position what we're looking to achieve. So. In the emulator world, we have people like PacketStorm down here. And then we have kind of our IP analyzers that include generators. We have products like Bridge Technology with their VB440, which is kind of right at the forefront of monitoring multiple IP strings and multiple channels that you're broadcasting. And this is the area we're now looking to find products to work in, this IP test and measurement world. So SIMPT2110, I won't hang around on this slide too long because we all know the numbers, we all know what they do, and these are the various subsuites of the 2110 standard. So 
So here we have a traditional network with your PTP grandmasters, your GPS, working down through transparent clocks, boundary clocks, down to your slave devices. Factors that can impact broadcast operation. So we can have packet loss due to network overload and error frame discard. We can have bandwidth restrictions due to compensation technologies like forward error connect connection, automatic repeat queries, hit this protection. All of these things are adding an overhead onto the system. And when the packet is excessively delayed, the buffer will underflow and it will become impossible to reproduce the video stream. Underpinning all of this, you need PTP and it has to be stable and strong. If it's not, it will undermine everything you're trying to do on top of that. It's like the foundations of the whole IP solutions. PTP is the core of this. So the measuring methods. So we use tools like the frame check sequence, psychic redundancy check monitoring, measuring the packet arrival interval and checking whether the packets are being transmitted stably and monitoring the stability of the PTP. And these measures review the network system and the quality of service of the switches and the networks and the whole architecture. So into packet arrival time. So as the network becomes more complicated, it is important to monitor each service because the separation at the time of failure will have significant impact on your business. So you need tools that first of all allow you to identify your sources. Then displays that give you a view of the network traffic. These are very high level displays, but these are the first points that you're gonna start to see that you could have potential problems. These should be nice and stable, but if you start to see dips and peaks in them, it means something is happening within your network, and then you need the suite of tools to go deeper. You also need tools that will give you a high level indication of errors within those packets, because again, this could have serious implications further down the chain. So as you move from the camera, which is traditionally the source, and here we have an indication of how you'd see the IP address of that, to the multicast flow and how its address is visible. You need devices that allow you to identify what these addresses are, because unless you're walking around with a big folder full of Excel spreadsheets, or you can remember thousands of these, it's going to be very difficult for you to identify and remember which one's which. I said, there is the possibility that excess packet delay occurs due to network systems, and therefore the stream cannot be produced because the buffer of the receiving device just can't handle that type of delay. So by measuring the packet arrival interval, this checks whether the packet arrival, we have stability in the transmitted system. And this is how we typically see a packet arrival in a stable system. If we have issues, we could start to see this, where they are grouped together, and then there is a big area where nothing is being transmitted, and then it will try and catch up again. And this will be showed on measurement tools with graphs that will give you the packet arrival interval time display. And a number of manufacturers have products here that will show this from anywhere from two seconds up to 72 hours so that you've got a very snapshot view of your network or you've got a much longer term view. Obviously, I've just been talking about one stream there. Redundancy is a key part of any system design and its operation. So SMPT 2022-7 gives us that redundant operation. And um, this graph, I think, is, has been published before, and it explains the various measurements that can take place on the first path, the second path, and then how the signal is reconstructed 
and what the path delay is so that we end up with a completely uninterrupted flow at our receiver. So this is where you now need tools that give you the ability to monitor not just the first path or the second path, but also the path delay, which is probably a much more valid measurement because when you're looking at the path delay, you're looking at both path one and path two, so you can see what your max, your min, and your averages. But probably more importantly, if one of those services fail, you've still got a picture, but now you've got a clear indication that you're now running only on one path because the path delay has timed out. As I mentioned, the precision timing protocol underpins everything SMPTE 20, 2110 is about. So the PTP synchronization, I think you're all familiar with the graphic I've put up there. It's a two-step approach. And time synchronization of PTP is done by a sync, follow-up, delay request, and a delay response message. And this allows us to calculate the offset, assuming that the message is transmitted from the master to the slave and from the slave to the master at the same time. And as soon as packet delay time occurs, due to the packet retention time of the switch, path changes of the network, etc., so the average transmission time will fluctuate. So time synchronization, synchronization with SMPTE 2059 1 has to be less and maintained at less than one microsecond. So the phase of PTP video and the phase of PTP audio are stable. So again, you will now see measurement tools that will allow you to dis display the PTP offset as a graph, again running maybe from two minutes right the way up to 72 hours, and also the delay time. Also, it's worth noting that um, these display devices now will also indicate the PTP generator and when it's an event and what these mean if you need to get in and fault find your PTP network. So again, here you've got a breakdown of all the figures, your T1s, your T2s, how they're calculated, the max mins, of those. And as SMPTE 2110 contains a large volume of asynchronous data, if the network switch can't handle this data rate, it can impact upon the propagation delay of the PTP announcements. So the offset and delay graphs are a very good indication of the stability of maybe the whole network. One key point here. In order to maintain PTP synchronization, it is necessary to have PTP compliant switches or the ability to adjust the quality of service to handle PTP. If your switches start delaying PTP messages, it's going to go wrong very quickly. And again, a quick breakdown of the port numbers and the various commands that... Um, tie in with those ports and those messages. And it's also very important to see what the PTP sample rate is because this can also give you an indication of potential issues on the network. So PTP and RTP timing measurements, it can be confirmed whether the video, audio and ancillary data are synchronized with PTP by comparing the timing information of the PTP and the timestamp. So in an ideal world, our video, our audio, and our ancillary metadata will have RTP timestamps that bring them all back together. We're engineers, we're people, we know the ideal world doesn't always exist. So again, you now need tools that will give you a display. Thus, you can see 
what might be a delay with the audio, video, and again, as I said, with the software-defined networks, you can pick the points on your network to measure them so you can identify where potential issues are being introduced and then carry out the necessary fault finding. Timing comparisons, RTP and PTP. This graph picture I showed you earlier from an SDI world, um, that a number of manufacturers are also using this in the IP world. So it's the first time here, instead of black and burst as a reference, you're seeing PTP. But please remember with 2110, in an SDI world, you would want the timing so that your vertical phase and your horizontal phase are zero. With 2110-20, that's not the case. Because remember, here we have the end of active video. Here we have the start of active video. Here we have the end bit, which marks the end in a SMPTE 2110 world. With 2110-20, we're only moving the active video. There is a 21-line delay. There is also a 4.152 horizontal phase delay. We've seen people who have tried to put the systems to time these back to zero. Because of what's going on here, you've got to bear this in mind. So these figures here are for an interlaced image. They will change for progressively scanned image. So again, you need tools that will allow you to identify these. And as you can see here, this figure the total phase delay of 626 microseconds is displayed on this chart here. So timing comparisons are a vital part of ensuring that your systems remain healthy and um, don't lead to issues escalating. And here is a graphic where we have both video and audio and if there was ancillary data on here, you'd see a purple line appearing. Another key part of the 2110 um, measurement and analysis tools is to be able to identify what's going on with the packet header information. And you'll find devices now that have the ability to display like the MAC address and details, IP details, the UDP and RTP, and these tools now allow you to have this running in real, in real time so that you can see it updating and refreshing or you can freeze it. And then for 2110, obviously the payload ID as well. Another key area, and this is kind of in the SDI world was kind of cable loss damage connectors, is the health of your SP, SFPs. Are they a compliant bandwidth to the network you're working on? How many times does somebody just give you an SFP, there's no identification on it, you plug it in, is it a 10 gig, 1 gig, 25 gig? Is it multi-mode, is it single mode? All this information you need to display and understand. And the final piece of this is the error log. We now have a completely different set of error log messages in an IP world. And um, including messages like picking up here when the grand master has changed. So the best master clock algorithm has identified there is a better grand master, it's changed over. If you start to see that switching between two of them, again, your PTP be could become an issue. It could undermine the health of the whole of your system. So really you need tools that can allow you to display all of these screens simultaneously. And here, an example with the IP status, so that's giving you that high level view on your network and the traffic and the flows that you have available. Here, you have a tool that will allow you to simultaneously view the PTP either offset or delay or it could be path delay that you're monitoring here if you're working in a redundant system. 
inter-packet arrival time, which is the critical piece to ensure that the packets are still being delivered in a timely fashion for the receiving device. IP face timing with PTP. So the last piece I'm going to add on this is, obviously, we've talked here about SMPTE 2110 and the IP operation. For most of you, the IP operation is going to have to coexist with an SDI world. And having tools that can allow you to monitor both SDI and IP are going to become critical. So as we said, with SMPTE 2110, the information has been removed from the underlying hardware layer, making the distribution asynchronous. With current broadcast format, video must be frame synchronized at the camera sensor, and at the display device, the television. With the intermediate IP distribution network is asynchronous, the, but the variance in packet jitter and affected latencies lead to potentially longer video and audio delays than we have come to expect with an SDI in infrastructure. So although uncompressed video, such as that provided by 2110, does map into the active video parts of SDI, two major changes have occurred. The PTP and ST SPG may or may not be derived from the same device. The signal distribution in IP is as asynchronous and it's multiplexed. So the only way to make meaningful comparisons between SDI and IP signals in a broadcast facility transitioning to IP is to use SDI and IP monitoring that exists and resides within the same piece of equipment. Thus, you can have tools that can operate in what we I use the term a true hybrid mode where you can see simultaneously both your IP and your SDI signals. So the only difference between these are here. The status display, if you're familiar with SDI, is your CRC, your TRS checks. And over here, you have the IP status, which is showing you your multicast flows, your network traffic, and your high-level error counts. And in a multi-channel operation, you will need to monitor a mixture of these. Because errors that appear to be video related, which may even be gateway related, could actually be down to the fact that you're moving from PTP to black and burst reference and move it, those reference are not timed together. If this has intrigued you and you want more information, we have prepared a guide to talk about IP hybrid tester measurement. Copy of these are available from Lender on the way out. Um, at that point, if you want to see this, it is on the leader booth. But if you have any questions, I think I've got five minutes left. Um, I'm here. <laughs> and I've caught Wes out. <laughs> Sorry, we were uh, playing with microphones as we've been wont to do. All right, so Kevin, um, just to um, make sure that, that we're under control, um, Tina has a bunch of Sorry, uh, handouts there. So as you leave, uh, feel free to take that, or she, you can, uh, she'll come up and hand them out. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes, here we go. Hi, just one basic question. Th you said the SMPTE spec was edge devices within one microsecond. Um, what would it be a typical value you might find? Whoa. My mind is now going through that graph that talks about... <laughs> all of the SMPTE 2059, because obviously the um, IEEE 1588, which it comes from, covers a much wider spectrum, and there are different, if I get the correct term, there are different classes, aren't there, within the 1588, because mm -hmm. obviously the broadcast is one of the classes. You've got finance banking, high rate transactions, power stations, and all that type of stuff. So my understanding is, where's my correct if I'm wrong on this one, that they try to replicate as closely as possible to the timing standard from black and burst. 
Right. Well, I mean, one of the big advantages that we have is that we don't care about the phase of analog uh, color carriers anymore. You know, so so we don't need to be anywhere near as precise as that. You know, um, my understanding is that any you know, if you're within a microsecond, you're in pretty good shape, pretty much every wherever you go. So. Um, I'd, I'd use that number. Uh, there was a lot of debate when that number was derived for SMPTE. Um, so I would uh, stick with that. The, the more important number to me is the convergence time. You know, how many seconds does it take from when a device plugs in to when it's actually synchronized? And that five second is, uh, that's a fairly long time when you're on live video, but it's, it's um, pretty critical that your devices make at least that. They have to get in, they have to be synced up to the network within five seconds. Um, and there could still be a little float up and down, but a microsecond's pretty darn good, you yeah. know, for almost any practical application. Okay. All right. I think we're out of time. Kevin, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. And feel free to get to the uh, quick reminder for everybody. Um, all of these videos will be posted on the um, VSF YouTube website, and there will be a link at. Uh, at uh, VSF.TV that will uh, give you uh, the ability to download the presentations as soon as they're posted. Um, and we'll be setting up for a panel, so give us a couple minutes and we're good to go. Thanks.